I'm Kat Hoybeck and welcome to this experimental pilot video edition of Inbound. Here's what we've got for you in store. now for 10 years. Um, oh god, that shows my age, doesn't it? Uh, but uh, I think publishing tends to go in swings and roundabouts, so mm. um, when I first started everyone was sort of cutting back on books mm. and then there was a big sort of, you know, let's go out and buy more books and now people, again, you know, sort of because of the recession and everything were being very, very focused about yeah. what we publish and how we publish it. So it's, it's the same with any industry, there are trends. So Things like horror, obviously huge in the 80s, not so big in the 90s, yeah. and now making a comeback now. So, yeah, it's, it changes all the time, it keeps it interesting. Um, any particular gushing about this book? Oh, I could gush about all of them. So, I, you know, I think 2011, we've got some, we have got some really exciting books coming out. So, we've got a new book by China Miegel called Embassy Town, which I know the fans are going to go completely wild <laughs> for because it's just such an amazing read um, and we've been doing some really interesting things with his backlist and we're republishing and we're doing new covers for them yeah. which are totally top secret and no one's allowed to see them until next year um, Alan Campbell's got a new book coming out, Sea of Ghosts which is just the most amazing fantasy I've ever for ages, it's just wonderful um, you know, it's got everything in there that, that, that people want. Morally ambiguous hero, drug addicted dragons, drag drug addicted dragons. Drag addicted dragons. It's brilliant. It's just so imaginative. And we've got a new um, Alden Bell coming out in uh, I think it's September next year as well. So yeah, I've got I've got a lot a lot of new books coming out and just hugely excited about all of them. Uh, well, so can I ask you a question? Okay. Yeah. Would you would you would you pick a card, please? No, can't any card. It's fine. You, anyone? Um. No. Blogs. <laughs> fine. How do you feel about blogs? Uh yeah. No, blogs are great. Uh, there should be more of them. Especially. Uh, Especially. Uh, who are you from again? Yeah, I'm banned. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> nice. Thanks. <laughs> I think what we've always tried to do is publish really good, intelligently written speculative fiction. Uh, and so that's everything, you know, trying to do something a little bit new with a genre. Um, you know, things like The Reapers Are the Angels could have been published on Picador, could have been published at Pan Macmillan, could have been published at Tor. And those are the sorts of books I love, that nobody is quite sure where they fit. You know, I, 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 I hate books that you can just automatically pigeonhole. So I think the thing I love about, you know, any of these books is there's so much, there's, it's not just genre, there's a wider readership out there, and, and so that's what I want for Tor, is to be, you know, picked up by, by everyone. Uh, you okay? Mm. What's, what's this? Well, well, that is the card that you would have picked had you deigned to actually choose one. 
any any more of this match business and I'm going to show you a trick where I take this card and shove it up your Present today in association with Story UK. If we look at the authors that were here today, um, Peter F. Hamilton um, is his third in the Void trilogy, The Evolutionary Void, um, came out in September. Uh, he's, this is kind of really the finale of his, um, his author tour. I write science fiction, quite large science fiction books. The book I'm writing at the moment um, is set again about 140 years time and we'll deal with, with planets uh, other than Earth, the people go on. But they'll still have the same problems that we have here today, just reflected differently through the technologies that emerge, through the different societies that have evolved. Um, but it's still a mirror, very much a mirror for what's going on today. Adrian, because of how prolific he is, um, he, we've, we publish two Shadows of the App books a year, um, so he's always got something new to talk about. Well, I'm Adrian Tchaikovsky, I write the Shadows of the App fantasy series. The Interkindle and the various races of the Shadows of the Apt, they are races of humans, but they've got inter-characteristics. So there are Antkinden who have uh, linked minds, and they're very martial and warlike, and most of the time they spend feuding against each other. There are Mantiskinden who are extremely swift and deadly fighters. The Beetlekinden, who are probably the central race of the series, are industrious and very, very adaptable. Insects are often a very useful metaphor. A lot of writers have used them in that way to describe various parts of the human character, parts of the human condition. And then Mark Chow Newton, um, constantly a kind of hive of activity in terms of kind of PRing himself. <laughs> he is, um, he is good. And I think he's just a really good person to be involved because he will talk about it when he's yeah, absolutely. promoting it on his site. Um, I'm Mark Chow uh, Newton. I also write fantasy fiction um, for the Legend of the Red Sun series and my shoe size is sort of nine and a half or ten, depending on the shoe. I don't like talking about my own books. I kind of feel, I don't know, it feels really awkward talking about my own books that much. Um, I'll talk about the third book. The third book is um, it's called the, the Book of Transformations. It's the third in the series. And it features... Um, a main character who is a transgendered woman, she's a trans woman. We go back to Filgemoor, the original city in the first novel. Crime is so rampant now that the Emperor needs to create a force of, of quite superhero, well, superheroes basically. Yeah, I thought that would be a really fun thing to play with because I'm writing for myself as much as anyone else. Tony Valentine is just simply one of the best chairs I've ever... He is fantastic. As well as being a brilliant kind of author, raconteur, he's really good at that chairing a whole event. Yes, absolutely. That's yeah. why I asked him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Tony Valentine and uh, my most, most recent novel was Blood and Iron, set on the robotic world of Penrose. To make a robot, you take a, a length of wire and twist it, and that makes it intelligent. Nothing more that's required to, to make a mind than that. Um, there was something about that which fascinated me, the idea that you can have something which is so purely mechanistic. You know, take a piece of wire, twist it, and you make a mind. Um, that's quite a big bit of the book, because if you had the ability, if you're going to make your child, uh, if you had the ability to choose exactly what that child would turn out like, what would you do? with it. Would you make it shy or would you make it happy? Would you make it fight for itself? Would you make it selfish or generous? Because you'd have to make all of those choices. I don't know, I found that really quite an interesting idea. You know, I've got children myself. If you could choose your children, how would you make them? And what sort of world would arise from, you know, from that premise? It's quite a recent move for writers to be public figures to that extent. So actually, it's, it's really nice to see four people who are really confident and really, mm. uh, really eloquent and really expressive. Uh, it's great. Also with those four authors, I think they're, they're all at different stages in their career, which is quite good, I think, when you're kind of showcasing mm. Because you can have someone like Peter, who's so many books in, and he's so, you know, he's, he's so well established, and then newer voices like Mark's, and um, I think it's 
a good opportunity. It's a good dynamic. Yeah. Um, so that was that was kind of part of the process, the thought process behind choosing those four. I'd like to thank everybody, thank you, Adrian, Mark, Peter, I'm going to thank myself as well. Um, as I've got the microphone and I get to finish it, I'm just going to say, SF is better. Thank two fantasy authors and two sci-fi authors getting together and discussing the two genres, how they're similar, how they're different. Um, that's been really interesting. The panel earlier on when all four of them were having a conversation about that was really good. I didn't know what to expect when I turned up. Um, and then when the first panel started, I mean, I, the, you go into the auditorium, it was mostly full, which was wonderful. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Going on my we're trying to film a video. We're trying to film a video. We're trying to film a wonderful event. I always find the, uh, these events quite intimate. It's nice to reach out to people who don't normally read the genre. Because it's safe to kill them, and you can kill them in all manner, in manner of ways, including um, humorous. Yeah, the authors have all said that they've enjoyed it. It's been tiring. You work with authors very hard um, at this event. They might as well just be robots. There's nothing more to do but they're just essentially cardboard cutouts. But I'm tired. Keep talking. Nothing too much I want to add, apart from if I'm invited back next year, I'll say yes. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. I can, I can relax now. Go <laughs> bask in the glow of the tree. I'm going to buy you a plant. I've got a plant. Much appreciated. Oh. I'd cook. Oh, really? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Monkeys. Punks. Raising. Three words which often are not combined, or at least not in any way which is savoury. However, Raise Monkey Punk is a new website which is designed to change all that. A website which combines science fiction, fantasy and horror short fiction with monkeys as a force for good. Raise Monkey Punk is the brainchild of American genre fiction genius Tim Pratt, a man who threw the idea out on Twitter where it was rapidly picked up and converted into a website. The website's concept is simple. Authors can submit stories featuring monkeys doing science fiction, fantasy and perhaps most disturbingly horror things and readers can read them there for free. The only price is if they like it, there is a PayPal button to donate to charity. Each dollar donated to the site guarantees one person clean drinking water for one year. However you cut it, that's a pretty amazing act of charity, especially as all you have to do is go there, read a short story about a monkey, probably in a spacesuit, maybe holding a sword, maybe a chainsaw, perhaps even an undead zombie monkey in a spacesuit wielding a chainsaw, and then donate. It's easy, and besides, it's nice to be nice. If you like your fiction with a healthy dose of ga and possibly even a light liberal seasoning of eek, then you need to be spending a lot of time at Dark Fiction Online. Dark Fiction Online launched a month ago, and what they do is essentially offer you for free, because they love you, uh, and a rolling horror anthology of short fiction, which they'll even read to you. The first issue includes Maybe Then I'll Fade Away by Joseph DeLacy, which is entirely exclusive to them and read by someone who sounds not unlike your intrepid newscaster. It's actually me. Pumpkin Night by Gary McMahon. Do You See by the magnificent Sarah Pinborough, which was actually awarded the 2009 British Fantasy Society Best Short Story Award, and perhaps the last by Conrad Williams. Future episodes have lined up Pat Cadigan, Corey Doctorow, John Courtney Grimwood, Kim Lake and Smith, and the mighty, mighty Rob Sherman. All of this and more can be found online now at darkfictionmagazine.co.uk. You really should go and check it out, because it's great. And if you don't, I'll look at you. Oh, hello. I'm Cthulhu. Welcome to this month's Inhuman Interest story. It's come to my attention that an upstart anthology called Machine of Death recently reached the top of the Amazon bestseller list. This is not acceptable. The upstarts responsible for it were inspired by a strip on dinosaur comics involving the idea for a film. This idea was put forward by a T-Rex to begin with, 
I'm glad they were extinct, although they were delicious. The idea is simple. A world where everyone knew exactly how they would die, but not when. They were intrigued by this, more intrigued than the T-Rex was, truth be told, and went away to construct, in detail, a series of short stories set in this world, dealing with how you would react if you knew how, but not when, you would die. Some time ago this book was released, and due to a grassroots publicity campaign, they achieved the number one slot on the Amazon bestseller list. On the same day that my deep, close personal friend Glenn Beck released his latest book about how we're all doomed and evil. Of course I am. I'm Cthulhu. But they beat Mr. Beck to the number one slot and this cannot stand! I demand a letter writing campaign. I demand sacrifices. I demand the points of view special. Immediately. Or better still, go to machineofdeath.net and register your complaints. But do not buy it! Or I will know. I'm James Lang, I'm Editorial Director for Digital at uh, Pam McMillan and I work very closely with the Tor Books team. Hi, I'm Manny uh, Lang and I am the uh, designer on Sci-Fi Fantasy uh, list here at McMillan. going to say next but I've forgotten it. So um, <laughs> supply me with something, say something, <laughs> start talking about yeah. something. As someone like Peter of Hamilton who we've obviously enjoyed lots of success with the Evolution of Void which came out in September and it went straight into the top ten. We did a, um, a feature with SFX. Jonathan Wright who's a brilliant um, interviewer um, kind of got in touch with Peter really early on so that they could kind of create um, Almost like a diary for Peter of um, a diary of a space opera yeah. to watch how the you know how it was progressing from his early writing stages. We are busy redeveloping our website because yeah. it, it needs a bit of updating, um, but that's quite a big project. So certainly for next year, it'll mostly be um, author websites. Mm. Uh, a great example is is this one, um, shadowsoftheapt.com, which is for Adrian Tchaikovsky's series. It's essentially his blog, um, but the nice thing is we've added. Um, not only an events page, but a, a world page where you get to learn more. So it, it's world building material, really. So there's a map of the world, um, and there is uh, artwork of all the different insect kingdoms. So the, the ebook of the first volume um, of the series, uh, Empire in Black and Gold, has got some of this uh, content in it. So if you go and get the ebook, you get extra yeah. stuff. Are there particular types of books you like really enjoy doing covers for? Like the spacey I mean, ones with the spaceships, or sorts of really intense, menacing, coloured ones? Uh, they're both really. I mean, we've got, say, um, the Shadows of the App series that we're doing. These are always interesting in that the author sends us sketches of these characters. Oh, right. We get sort of little sketches. <laughs> and then from that, we um, come up with sort of a more finished illustration. So here's, here's where we ended up. There's such crazy creatures and characters that you do need a little help sometimes with some of them. Even describing them in words is, is so difficult, but you know, when you've got a visual thing, mm -hmm. it's so much easier to work from that. Do you find it helps more if the author sends in pictures like that, or if sometimes you're just like, oh, that's not good? I think you're going to have to say no, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, on this one, I think it really does, uh, because he's got something in mind, really, yeah. you know, that's quite personal to him as well, I guess. Uh, so I think, yeah, on this, it really did help. Acquisitions are particularly exciting mm. when something comes in that uh, Julie, for example, the tour uh, publisher, would send down, and she says, this is a really exciting uh, book, everyone's going for it, all the other publishers are in the mix at the same time, and you have to go home that night, read it overnight, and um, you come back the next morning and say, it's fantastic, let's go, let's get it. Yeah. So I love that kind of excitement about the books. You get the chance to read fuel through all of your books, or does it sometimes get to the point where you're like, oh, no, not that oh, one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, if yeah. you're going out there and talking about books, you have to know what you're talking about. Are there ever some books where you think, oh, my God, I don't know how I'm going to promote this? Um, like, yeah, I mean, there are. It's... Like, if I, um, absolutely, because um, looking outside of 
just tour for a second, you might be doing publicity mm. for a book who's also died 20 years ago. We did this last year for Hitchhikers, which was really my favourite project of the year. It was the 30th anniversary of Hitchhikers Guide to yeah. the Galaxy last year, and we did um, wonderful print reissues where for book one you had a blank space background as your cover and there's yeah. an insert of stickers you could create, you could oh, make your cool. own cover, do yourself covers. We also added some extras as we're talking about here, so mm. lots of um, cool stuff, past covers of the book, um, Stephen Fry reading from the audiobooks, uh, Marvin on Twitter tweeting about um, the life of the universe and everything. That would be brilliant. Um, yeah, it was really good and um, it was so much fun doing that. My favourite comment from Twitter about him was yeah. it was refreshingly downbeat. <laughs> <laughs> no, what really makes me mad? They clean me with a Brillo pad A car wash wouldn't be so bad Life, don't talk to me about life It's a nice showpiece really of how oh. digital can kind of start to to give you an experience around the book in the same way as you might get an experience from meeting the author or from yeah. um, the physical packaging of the book, you know, that stuff can always be pretty good fun. Are there any that you're still working on that you can have a little look at? <laughs> um, Among Thieves, actually, that's one that's almost there. I'm also really excited about Among Thieves um, by yeah. Douglas Hewlett. We saw the beginnings of the title pages for that downstairs. Oh, good. Okay, what did you think? It's good, it looks good, yeah. <laughs> Judging by the cover. <laughs> well, the Reapers of the Angels is yeah. a book I'm really excited about because it has real crossover potential and in sales that's something that we're... Sorry to interrupt, I just wondered if any of you have seen The White Rabbit, perhaps, anywhere? No, we're <laughs> doing an interview. Uh, Sorry. Stationery. Always in the stationery cupboard. Sorry. Yeah, that's where you should go. Sorry. It happens quite it often then. Yeah, we like to distract any uh, interviewers or retailers that come in. A bit of magic is never a bad thing. I think it is. <laughs> Whatever, carry on. Uh, um, books. Reapers, yes. <laughs> Sorry, is that, uh, that rabbit still? But, um, <laughs> but it, it's, um, it's an apocalyptic zombie thriller. So what could be Epic. more exciting than that? This is such a personal favourite yeah. for so many of us. Zombies. Yeah. <laughs> Central character is that um, frightening looking the girl on the one. cover. And <laughs> she is. She, I mean, she's just one of the best protagonists, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, absolutely. She'll stay with me for a yeah. long time. She carries a gherkin knife with her, which, oh, yeah. um, which she uses to, to fend off these, uh, these horrible creatures. And I was so happy to read kind of someone exploring um, narrative in the way that he does. The writing of it is fantastic. And it's something that you don't often see in, in a clearly yeah. thriller, you know, fantasy style writing. Um, we're comparing it to The Road in that respect. Just so well written. So it's out Zombies. in hardback now and then paperback next year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also really excited about um, Heaven Shadow, which is a newly acquired mm -hmm. book um, by David Goyer, who's Christopher Nolan's scriptwriter for Batman. No, I like that. Then you're going to love me. That's brilliant. It's a kind of... <laughs> Um, it's really like a, a political thriller in space, mm. it's really kind of Michael Crichton-esque. It starts yeah. very kind of mainstream space race and then it just goes off into this amazing <laughs> real SF tangent. Like you said with the authors that have been dead for so long, but with the <laughs> Pan Book of Horror, I have noticed like, <laughs> it seems to be like, at all the events I seem to be going to, it's like, oh, Pan Book of Horror. Oh, Pan Book of Horror. <laughs> oh, right, Pan Book of Horror. Yeah, what's that about again? What we did do for the Pan Book of Horror stories was to split out the individual stories, so we've made an ebook per story. Oh, right. The great thing about it is, you know, if you just want something quick to read, especially on the phone maybe, um, then it's, you know, 99p and it's it's one story and it kind of links you through to the other ones if you're interested. Uh, being a bit of a collector of Panda Cora memorabilia, these two are original bookmarks, obviously I've reprinted, from the a couple of earlier Panda Cora um, publications that they created back in the like, 70s, I think. So we were able to um, stick them on some bookmarks and get them back out there. It's an exciting time for short stories because they're a format that, you know, had sort of Easy to gone very us. quiet. But I think, you know, digital is actually going to be a real, uh, give a real new life to, to short stories. These sort of badges, mm. so they, they'll be they're amazing. Release really you know. the Kraken. That was obviously for Charlie Mayfield's um, hardback Kraken. So they were given out. <laughs> 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 so we were given to retailers, and they were used at his signings. And yeah, and, and, and that phrase things. kept. You kept that phrase kept being. Yeah, I mean we online. used it on our advertising as well. So it was just a man to be took out in um, Sci-Fi Now and SFX, and just repeated the message. Oh. So that's one thing I will say about science fiction fantasy authors. They are the most dedicated, mm -hmm. I'd say. Mm -hmm.
a bit biased, but <laughs> the loveliest, loveliest <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. pleasure. Yeah, pleasure yeah. to see all because they, they're, they're, speaking, they're such um, uh, like geniuses in their fields. They have so much knowledge around mm. um, science fiction and I mean, they're brilliant for pub quizzes. Just get one you see, it always wins. <laughs>my name's Lee Harris, and for the past 56 years my job has involved bringing law and order to the mean streets of publishing, so I know the carnage that can ensue when a writer gets things wrong. The sinking of the Titanic, the burning of the Hindenburg, the destruction of the Death Star. All tragedies that could have been avoided had aspiring writers followed ten basic rules. Give or take two or three either side, which in practice means that we're talking between seven and thirteen, but for brevity's sake, I went with the average. In a moment, we're going to take a look at one of these rules and find out what happens when you cross the line. Right now, I'm going to fold my arms and stare off in that direction with a grizzled intensity that even a grizzly bear with a master's degree in grizzledness couldn't match. Because I'm Lee Harris. I'm an editor. And that's what we do. This author has just written the greatest book conceived by man, beast or fish, though the last one is open to debate given our relative lack of knowledge concerning the mysteries of our deepest oceans. However, this man is about to piss his genius away with this query letter that landed on my desk this very morning. I shall read it to you. Yo, Miss Harris. How's it hanging? Finding clothes, the best book what was ever wrote. It's awesome. Please publish ASAP. Ta. That is not a professional query letter. The author called me Miss. As you can see, I'm married. It's written, not wrote. And although the author had the right number of apostrophes, they were all in the wrong place. The writer didn't even include their name and contact details, possibly because they also included some anthrax powder with the letter and a threat to kill me if I should dare to send a rejection. Let me tell you this, viewer. I did not send him a rejection letter, and nor did I go to the police. I tracked down this writer, and I set fire to his pet dog. Then I found his pet dog's family and friends and set fire to them. And then I found every photograph of this man and his dog and drew a comedy moustache on each one. Because sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. And a stitch in time saves nine, and the course of true love never did run smooth. And as we in the business say, if your query letter is garbage, then every letter in your manuscript is likely to be garbage too. Editors are busy people. We don't have the time to read through mountains of manuscripts that are, on the balance of all probability, the literary equivalent of rectal peptic ulceration. And after all, those dogs are not going to set fire to themselves. Woof! Do your research. Read the submission guidelines. Your query letter is the first piece of your writing that an agent or a publisher sees. Be professional. That's all for now. Write well. Stay safe. And if I'm right about the mysteries of the world's deepest oceans, put your money on a guppy winning the Booker Prize next year.